Hello, I'm Joe O'Brien. You're watching ABC News 24. The opposition leader, Bill Shorten, and his Labor team have just begun a media conference there in Sydney today. Uh, the, the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, is also in Sydney today. We can expect to hear from him pretty soon as well. Uh, let's take a listen in now to this uh, Labor, major Labor media uh, camp, uh, media event for the day, uh, three days out from the election in 2016. In the airport, the busiest airport in the country. Both these important pieces of infrastructure employ thousands of people in the electorate that I represent, are in very important to our nation's productivity and economic growth. Now, Labor will invest in these facilities and others throughout the country. We'll also invest in upgrades and new infrastructure. In this electorate, the electorate of Kingsford Smith, we've already announced a $108 million duplication of the freight rail line from Mascot into Port Botany. That will mean that more of the freight from this busy container terminal will come out on a rail line rather than on trucks, taking about 300,000 truck movements off local roads per year. So in the process we'll create jobs, we'll make this port more productive and we'll improve the living standards and lifestyles of people living in the wonderful community that I represent. That project in itself is a great symbol of Labor's investment in infrastructure. And I'm now very pleased to hand over to our leader, Bill Shorten, who's going to talk a little bit more about this important announcement today and our commitment to infrastructure in Australia. Welcome, Bill. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here. Um, good morning, everybody. I guess we're close to the finishing line now, only three more days to go. But it's really great to be leading the only party with a serious infrastructure policy to put out at this election. Labor has led the debate about nation building infrastructure and today we're pleased to be able to launch our fantastic policies. Labor's infrastructure policy and what's contained in this policy is a blueprint for the growth of Australia. We are most committed to an infrastructure financing facility, a $10 billion concrete bank, which will unlock the opportunities for private sector investment to work with government investment to make sure that we build the infrastructure our country needs to move ahead in leaps and bounds. Only Labor's got a proper policy for cities. Only Labor has a policy to have a first-rate national broadband network. Only Labor's got a consistent commitment to public transport. Labor's committed to making sure that Infrastructure Australia becomes turbocharged with extra resources to help depoliticise infrastructure decisions, to make sure that we create a reserve bank of infrastructure policy in Infrastructure Australia. Labor's committed to making sure that we unlock the congestion in our cities, to make sure that we build the roads in our outer suburbs and regions that we desperately need. Labor stands here proudly putting forward its infrastructure propositions because we're committed to jobs, we're committed to infrastructure, we're committed to improving productivity in the competition of Australian enterprise. What I'd like to do now is invite Anthony Albanese to talk further about our policy and then I might just like to say some uh, further remarks on one other matter. Look, thanks very much, Bill, and it's great to be back here in Kingston Smith, the electorate with the uh, fine representative of uh, Matt Thistlethwaite. Uh, this electorate delivers, as Matt said, uh, two of the most important pieces of infrastructure that drive our economy. Can I say this, that it is uh, somewhat extraordinary that after three years, the Turnbull government have not yet released an infrastructure policy for this election. They haven't released a cities policy or a shipping policy or an aviation policy. Labor does all of that today. And we're able to do that because we have been working on this from day one. And you can trust us because when we were last in government, we doubled the roads budget, we increased the rail budget by more than 10 times, we invested more in urban public transport between 2007 and 2013 than all previous governments combined. We rebuilt, or, or had new, some 7,500 kilometres of roads and 4,000 kilometres of rail lines. We 
revolutionised the interstate rail freight network. We took six hours from the journey from Brisbane to Melbourne and nine hours from the east coast to the west coast. We created Infrastructure Australia and the major cities in it to drive that change. And what we would do is take Infrastructure Australia even a step further through the $10 billion infrastructure financing facility. We understand that economic growth is driven by investing in infrastructure and by investing in people. And together with our education, apprenticeship and trade policies and our infrastructure policies, we have a plan for the nation's growth. During this election campaign, we have committed to important projects such as Perth uh, Metronet, Brisbane's Cross River Rail, Melbourne Metro, Adelink Light Rail, Western Sydney Rail through Badgerys Creek, connecting up the North West with the Campbelltown sector. Our opponents talked about cities but haven't actually committed anything or committed to a structure like the major cities unit and they continue to undermine Infrastructure Australia's approach. We also have an approach to aviation and shipping that's consistent with Australia's national interest. What we've seen around our coast with the replacement of the Australian flag off the back of ships with foreign ships being paid, with foreign seafarers being paid foreign wages is a disgrace and is not in our national interest. We'd revitalise Australian shipping in terms of our national security interest, our environmental interest, as well as our economic interest. And we do the same in terms of the national interest in aviation. The current government during this term tried to also get rid of cabotage or Australian preferences for Australian aviation in our north. As Qantas and Virgin indicated at the time, that would be the thin end of the wedge and would see Australian airlines undermined. We have the most open system in the world, but it's one in which Australian jobs and Australian aviation plays a particularly important role. Aviation and shipping are by their nature international industries. They're ones that are competitive. They're ones that Australia competes with if it's allowed to on a level playing field. But what the current government has wanted to do and has done in shipping but also wants to do in aviation is open that up so that Australian wages are competing with foreign wages and Australian industry and jobs undermined. And our policies in these two areas indicate that we wouldn't do that. We have a comprehensive plan for infrastructure. The current government have four ministers for infrastructure. It's not clear who's in charge of any particular project, let alone who's in charge of major projects like the, the uh, Badgerys Creek Airport or major road and rail projects. That's why I'm very proud that the Labor Party remains the party of nation building. In Bill Shorten, we have a leader who understands infrastructure, who's provided every support uh, to me as the shadow minister after the last, over the last three years to back in the commitments that we've made during this election campaign and the comprehensive plan that we're seeing, not just today, but announced in the budget replies, announced in our city's policy that was announced in 2014. That's why we'll be ready to go on day one, if we're successful at the election on Saturday night, in getting this country moving when it comes to job creation through nation building infrastructure. Thanks, Anthony. I said before we took questions that I wanted to uh, just address a couple of other remarks. We are close to the finishing line. I'm sure some of you are pretty happy about that. But increasingly, I think the issues are coming into focus. People are now making decisions and they're focusing on what is most important in this election. Some of the key issues that people have been talking to me wherever I've travelled throughout Australia are jobs, education and Medicare. And many people report to me and explain to me that they feel let down by this government. They feel let down by the lack of a jobs approach to this government because of a lack of commitment to invest in infrastructure and apprentices. They feel let down in education by the stubborn refusal of the Liberals not to properly fund school education using the Gonski principles and to make it harder for working class kids to go to university by radically cutting the funding to universities and TAFE. And of course, 
there is real fear that if the Liberals are returned on Saturday night, the Medicare will be further undermined and dismantled piece by piece, brick by brick. I genuinely observe and discern a mood to change the government and we're going to fight this election right down to 6pm on Saturday night because our issues are biting. Are there questions? Mr Shorten, why is it um, the Western X project in your infrastructure plan? Do you and does Mr Albanese still support it or are you, do you want to rip it up and not say go ahead? We, we absolutely support the West Connects project, but let's face it, the government has made a complete mess of it and I might get Anthony to explain to you quite how they've made the mess that they have. Look, uh, there's now going to be an Australian National Audit Office uh, inquiry into the financing of uh, the West Connects project and that's because here at Port Botany you can see the problem. We're at the port. West Connects comes nowhere near the port. West Connex, in its original design, recommended by Infrastructure New South Wales, was that the number one priority which had to be addressed was getting access to the port. That was done prior to the port being privatised. So the port was privatised, the state government got the money, but the road that was supposed to fix the problem doesn't come here. It doesn't even come to the airport, it comes to the other side of the airport. So that's the problem here. And so in terms of... Uh, the uh, today's story, by the way, uh, what's interesting, and I've had a briefing from the department uh, only, uh, only today, uh, from my department, what's interesting there is that uh, the New South Wales environmental approvals happened on April 20. Greg Hunt sat on that for six weeks and didn't refer it to the Shadow Environment Minister until just a few weeks ago, until May 31, during during the, uh, the caretaker period. Now, major EISs aren't normally approved by government and opposition under the caretaker conventions. But in this case, it could have been approved by the department. The minister chose to not allow the department to approve it, but to bring it in, therefore delaying the project. So the question for Greg Hunt is why did uh, he intervene in his departmental processes and bring the project forward? That's a question for him to answer. International if you become Prime Minister at the weekend, you'll be the fifth Australian Prime Minister in just over three years. What can you say that would reassure people that your leadership will be any more stable than that over the last few years? We've got positive policies to invest in people, to invest in infrastructure, to make sure that we've got new industry in addition to our mining and resource industries which are supported. We've got fully funded policies and we've made some hard decisions. What we've done is trust the Australian people. We've shown the Australian people respect in this election campaign by outlining our policies. And we are most committed to working as a united team, which I think is in stark contrast to the current uh, Conservative government in Australia. And what we have done for the last three years of opposition is we've worked hard to provide a positive policy agenda for Australia, which focuses on promoting Australian jobs, focuses on providing our young people and mature age students the best possible quality education that a nation can give its people. And of course, preserving our universal health care system. We want people in Australia to be able to go and see a doctor when they're sick and not be discouraged by the price and the cost of health care. Mr George, how this week his conduct? How much damage will he do to the Labor's brand, particularly here in New South Wales? And does this add further weight to calls from parties like the Greens and Independents for a national ICAG? Well, first of all, let me say about Eddie Obeid's conduct. Simply disgraceful. Betraying the trust of people in the Labor movement and people who vote Labor, he deserves everything that he's got coming to him. But I also know that the matters that you speak about are state issues. I also know that this is uh, the final step in the process which has been unfolding for several years. I'm focused on the future. The Labor Party's learned a great deal in terms of our last three years of opposition on what is the basis of a successful government. In terms of our uh, issues about uh, federal integrity, I am definitely supportive of the Federal Labor Party, if we are former government, of reconvening the Senate committee investigating the value and the benefit and the pros and cons of a National Integrity Commission that was set up uh, by the Senate, which Labor supported, 
It now been uh, stopped because of this election. We want to get back to business of getting the Senate to investigate the merit of a National Integrity Commission. Is there a shortage in, this, in uh, Turkey? Oh, it's, oh sorry. Oh, yes, OK. Can you repeat it, please? Just get your thoughts on the terror attack. Yes, that is, uh, it's a deplorable attack. I, like thousands of Australians, went through Istanbul on the way to uh, the Gallipoli 100 years uh, centenary. Istanbul is a fantastic city. Turkey is a fantastic country. We have many uh, proud Australian uh, people of Turkish origin. So my heart goes out uh, to the population, to the people of Turkey, to the government of Turkey, and of course to the Australian Turkish population who have made such a great contribution uh, to this country. Mr Jordan, what's your stance on New Zealand immigration detainers? Well, uh, I think that if you break the law here, um, you shouldn't. Let's be very clear here. These are difficult issues. These are difficult issues. But if people break the law in Australia, well, then they've got to face the consequences of what, what they've done and what they've done wrong. It's just on the issue of you now, this woman has described your debate and your opposition to a clever strike over gay marriage is hysterical. What do you make of those comments, uh, considering that you two used to support the other side? Well, first of all, I've supported marriage equality. I've voted for it previously when it came into Parliament in previous terms. But I actually think what's happened since 2013 is that the debate has moved beyond the Parliament, putting the case to the people. The people are now leading in terms of public opinion on marriage equality. The people have changed my mind. I had a look at, uh, of course, everyone saw that Irish referendum. Remember, that was a bit of a, a real wake-up call to Australia. If the Irish could do it, a traditionally uh, very Catholic nation. I think a lot of Australians woke up after the Irish referendum in particular and said, well, we should do this. Why are we taking so long? I've also uh, seen lessons out of the Irish referendum show that, and they had to change it that way, they didn't have the mechanism available to us of legislating in Parliament to change the Marriage Act, that uh, that debate, whilst it was ultimately successful, did trigger some very ugly arguments. I do not see why uh, children of a same-sex couple have to go to school, when they go to school, see the vile and uh, anti and homophobic literature which was put out, which Irish kids had to see. I think the people of Australia, the majority of them, have clearly moved, even in the last two or three years, to supporting marriage equality, and all popular opinion polls would seem to indicate the truth of what I'm saying. So now the question is, what is the best way to achieve it? Malcolm Turnbull, in his heart of hearts, knows that a parliamentary vote is the most expeditious and fairest way to do these matters. He conceded in one of his rare public appearances with me during those debates, such as they were, he conceded that it was his second best option. Well, I don't see why Australian taxpayers should have to pay $160 million for the second best option, which was just a deal, a price that Mr Turnbull paid to get Conservative support in the Liberal Party to become leader of the Liberal Party. Why should Australians, not just people, not just same-sex couples, why should all Australians have to pay a price just because Mr Turnbull did a deal to appease the right wing of his party. Mr. Just back on New Zealand. On Four Corners the other night, you appeared to leave open the door to a possible refugee resettlement deal with New Zealand if you win the election. Um, is that what you're doing? Are you considering a possible deal with New Zealand? And would that not act as an incentive for people to come by boat to eventually be resettled in a first world country like New Zealand? Well, um, I appreciate the ABC's doing a bit of cross-promotion of their show there. Um, I stand by my comments that I made to the Four Corners, uh, Four Corners show. And indeed, let's also be very clear here. When it comes to deterring people smugglers, on July the 3rd, if Labor's successful, it's going to be the same blunt opposition, the determined opposition to people smugglers that they had on July the 2nd. Sorry, I just, I'd like to share the question to Lisa. Mr Shorten, Joe Bottle, the US ambassador, has ruled out Australia making any further concessions on the, the TPP in order to smooth its way through... Um, it's move its uh, passage through Congress. Is Labor in what's uh, step on that stance? And, and if not, are there some areas that uh, Labor would be comfortable revising um, if the alternative is to kill off the deal completely? Well, I haven't seen Ambassador Hockey's comments, uh, and I'll acquaint myself with them and the thinking behind them. When it comes to uh, free trade, Labor is up for achieving good free trade agreements. But as we've seen earlier this week, over a couple of days, I do not believe that this government is in full command of uh, the visa program. We've seen persistent, serious allegations of 457 visa rorting. We've seen un irrefutable evidence that it is possible for $50,000 to be able to get false and illegal visas and achieve false entry to Australia. 
One thing which we said about our free trade agreements is if they involve uh, the movement of natural people, that what we want to do is make sure that our visa system isn't, uh, being, isn't undermining the protections which Australian jobs have. In terms of the TPP, uh, we will look at the detail of that and if we form a government, we'll approach the negotiations in good faith. Are you a couple of days out from the election? I think there is a discernible mood to change the government. I think the issues which Labor are talking about jobs, education, Medicare, they are amongst the most important issues to Australians. Australians do fit down, feel let down by the Liberals, the way they've smashed the apprenticeship system, the way that they've surrendered control of their visa system to crooks and scoundrels, the way that they haven't really done very much at all in infrastructure, their retreat from uh, funding public, mass public transport uh, infrastructure and the jobs that go with it. Australians are very concerned that this government has let them down on jobs. They're very concerned that this Liberal government slept on education. They realise at this election we can end once and for all the education wars and the best way to fund them by voting Labor. And they feel very let down by Mr Turnbull and the Liberals' constant undermining of Medicare. Mr Turnbull should unfreeze the GP rebate, reverse his very harsh cuts to bulk billing incentives of blood tests and x-rays, and he should not be increasing the price of medicine. That just harms too many people and it undermines Medicare. How many seats do you need to win to prevent your colleague just here with you, Mr Albanese, becoming the next uh, Labor leader? No, seriously silly question. I rate that. Um, the point about it is we're in it to win enough seats to form a government. And I have to say, if you want to talk about unity, Let's have a look at how many seats does Mr Turnbull have to lose before Tony Abbott moves on him. The truth of the matter is that for the last three years, I and my team have worked very hard. We learnt the lessons uh, of 2013, and we are unarguably the most united we've been in probably two decades, and I'm very grateful to my team for that. Why is Labor surrendered to the government's delayed increase of the um, superannuation, superannuation guarantee uh, to 12 per cent, uh, rather than choosing a final I just couldn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Over the, Why has uh, Labor surrendered to the government's delay uh, to the increase of the superannuation guarantee um, to 12 per cent rather than choose a bus or bus? Oh, you'd never trust the Liberals to increase superannuation. You know the history of superannuation. I won't give it to you chapter and verse, but just a couple of key facts. It was uh, Labor working with unions and employers uh, who forwarded a 3% wage rise and put that into compulsory super. The Liberals had nothing to say and opposed that. Then when it was introduced in 1992, the compulsory 3% for all Australians, that was rejected. When it was moved to 9%, sorry, in 1992, that was rejected by the Liberals. When we sought to move it and increase it to 12%, the Liberals opposed it then and they froze in the increase. If you're worried about making sure that we lift the levels of compulsory superannuation, vote Labor on Saturday. Mr. Dan. Mr Shorten, there's been a, a robocall campaign that started overnight using the same quote that you highlighted yesterday at the press club. Mm. But as you are aware, that was just part of comments that Mr Turnbull made. In fact, it was taking aim at Labor. Do you support or endorse this type of campaign? Well, I don't accept the assumption of your question that Mr Turnbull's being quoted unfairly. In, I, I thought maybe someone might ask me that question, so I've actually got the quote which we say shows that Mr Turnbull can't be trusted with Medicare or schools funding and to make massive cuts. He had a ping at Labor. Well, that's sort of standard business for him. He can't talk about his own policies. But then he went on to say, the other point I would make is that what political parties say they will support and oppose at one time is not necessarily ultimately what they will do. Dan, I want to draw your attention. He says, what political parties? He didn't say what the Labor Party says. This fellow is so contemptuous of this election that he's already writing his leave pass before he's been elected. He said, what, other poli what political parties? If he just wanted to say the Labor Party, he would have just said Labor. He's normally pretty good at trying to complain about us. I think I've got to give Mr Turnbull marks for consistency, though. I've got to say something nice to say. I've I give him marks for consistency. Whenever he says anything which gets him into trouble, he very quickly moves to, I'm a victim and everyone's misrepresenting me. It was Mr Turnbull who said what political parties say isn't ultimately necessarily what they will do. This fellow, four days before an election, has warned Australians, don't trust me. Fine, if he wants to tell them that, so will we. Well, I don't know about every robocall campaign that's going on in this election. But I do support exposing a Prime Minister 
who is not prepared to say that he will keep his political promises. This is election time. This is the time when you put forward your program, economic and social, for the betterment of this nation. I stand by our election policies. I stand by our commitments in infrastructure, in aviation, in maritime industries. Mr Turnbull's saying, well, I may stand by it or I may not. He's the ultimate bet each way guy and he doesn't really expect to be held accountable and he just said what he really thinks. He gave us Malcolm Turnbull's political philosophy 101. Mr. Albanese, Sorry. 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 when Malcolm Turnbull says that Labor had one position on the school kids bonus and then they did another thing, is he wrong? Well, the idea, the, pro the proposal to get rid of the school kids bonus, that was Malcolm's decision. And frankly, he's the one. Remember Tony Abbott said there'll be no cuts in education? There's a famous sort of Penrith interview, that's where Liberal politicians go to say silly things. What he said, in, that was the policy which they all signed up to. Now Malcolm Nimble made the decision to scrap the school kids bonus. We've had to make tough decisions about which are the cuts that we can repair. What can we do sensibly without uh, re repairing the budget, without smashing the, the household budget? Our proposition for parents of school aged children is this. Vote Labor and you'll get the full Gonski based resources funding which ensures that every child in every school gets every support. So I think there was a question to Anthony. We've heard Bill's assessment of the, the past three years and the unity of the team. How do you think it's gone? Has he done enough and would you have done any different? Well, everyone, everyone has seen the last three years. What they've seen is the Labor Party under Bill Shorten's leadership that's taken the initiative on policies. Policies across the spectrum, education, health, infrastructure, the economy. We haven't been a small target at this election, and that is to the credit of the leader, Bill Shorten, and the entire team. And I back our team, our team across the board. I mean, Scott Morrison, every time I see him on an interview, I just cringe compared with Chris Bowen, who's so on top of the economy. When I look at health, uh, I look at, uh, at Catherine King, and I look at how on top of health care and the Medicare issue she is. On infrastructure, it's unclear to me who at any time I'm shadowing. Uh, all I know is there's a lot of them over there and they can't get their act together. Who is in charge of cities policy for this government? And can I say this, that on every single policy that I've put forward, I have had the total support of Bill Shorten and the leadership team. They have given me the freedom to go out there and negotiate with the sector the sort of comprehensive plans that we see being brought forward today. And that's why we are in a position of forming government, hopefully on Sunday. My objective, I spent 12 long years in opposition and I think I stand by my record. I understand that the key is whether you're round the cabinet table not dividing up spoils of opposition. No one in our show is interested in that. What we've been interested in for three years, and we've done each and every day as a united team, is how do we get back into government, not so that we can sit there for ourselves, but so that we can make Australia a better country. That's what drives us each and every day, and that's why uh, we're in a strong position uh, between now and Saturday, we've got three more sleeps to go. We're almost there. But uh, what I want to see on Sunday, I want to get my incoming brief as a minister in a shortened Labor government. That's my only focus. Mr Albanese, does the Martin Corbyn standoff in the UK prove to you, though, that giving rank and file membership, uh, you know, ballots in a leadership ballot, sorry, can create more problems than they solve? Good try. Uh, what the UK shows at the moment is. A, a, a little picture of what's coming down the track, of what happens when you have a weak leader who isn't in control of his party, who makes promises during an election campaign that can't be fulfilled. He promised, uh, Cameron promised, uh, the, uh, the Brexit poll, and it's ended up very badly indeed. Not just for him personally, who cares about that? It's ended up bad for Britain, it's ended up bad for the international economy. And that's what happens when you are so weak that you have a right-wing rump in your party that is dragging you behind. It's like a ball and chain. And you can see it on Turnbull as well. You can see that ball and chain dragging behind him as he tries to get around this campaign. You know, it's not the flu that's causing him the problem. It's the weight that he's carrying. And that's why uh, he's not fit to lead. 
Uh, it's over. They've been there for three years. Abbott was hopeless. Turnbull's been worse. Let's get rid of them on Saturday. <laughs> Listen, um, we Mr. might Shorten. take one more question. Oh, that was a pretty good ending. <laughs> You've got um, the PBO's questioned um, the reliability. I mean, sorry, the, there's questions over the reliability of you relying on negative gearing and um, capital gains tax um, in terms of your costings, and also um, combine that with the questions over um, hospital funding, considering there's only four years budgeted. Um, in your costings. Um, what are you going to do to try and win the economic argument in the last few days? Well, whilst I want to answer your question, I can't let the assumptions in your statement go unchecked. Uh, the PBO has released a statement today. They are they're aware that people are saying that what they've said is unreliable. The PBO is saying the exact opposite. And be, let's be straight here. The PBO costing a methodology is the same as the Treasury costing a methodology which the government rely upon. But we weren't content just with that. We got three of Australia's leading financial experts to be an independent costing panel. And those are, you know, led by uh, Bob Officer. And by the way, Bob Officer historically had done the work in the Commission of Audit for no less than John Howard, Mike Keating, James McKenzie. So we've got a costing panel. We've got the PBO who stands by their work. We've got the PBO who does exactly the same numbers as Treasury. I think the government's going to have to try a little harder to discredit us than that. And when we talk about our economic argument, it's very straightforward. Mr Turnbull is proposing to give away $50 billion out of the budget that this nation cannot afford to go away. I mean, let's call it as it is here. Mr Turnbull says that Brexit's very serious. Yet at the same time, he's advocating, in a time of what he says is serious economic events overseas, he's advocating to take $50 billion away from the Australian budget to pay it to large companies and overseas shareholders. He cannot have it both ways. Ivory thinks that Brexit was a serious issue, and on that basis he should cancel his corporate tax giveaway, which Australia can't afford, or he just doesn't think that's a serious issue which warrants him cancelling his signature policy. And in the meantime... We say that the best way to sustain growth and to develop the Australian economy and the best opportunities for Australians is invest in people. And you know the story there, from the early years of childcare right through the Gonski-based schools funding, to making sure that we put TAFE back at the centre of our vocational education strategy, to make sure that the, 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 the massacre and collapse of our apprenticeship, apprenticeship system is changed and we save that again. And of course, we want to see working class and middle class kids go to university. That's our people strategy. On our infrastructure, well, we've heard Anthony and I talk about that. We want to make sure that we turbocharge infrastructure policy making. We want to create a long-term policy bank and infrastructure by supporting Infrastructure Australia. We're backing it up with uh, roads funding, with public transport funding in our major cities, and of course the NBN. The NBN should be first-class technology, and Mr Turnbull's giving us second-class technology. And of course we want to diversify the Australian economy from its high reliance on the minerals industry. That's why, for instance, we're backing renewable energy. It's why we're backing the transition in the auto industry into other advanced manufacturing. It's why we will stand by the steel industry in Australia and Arium. It's why we've got tourism infrastructure funds to help turbocharge tourism jobs in this country. That's our economic plan for Australia. Invest in people, invest in infrastructure, and make sure that we have new industries to diversify our economy. Thank you very much. OK, so that was live from Sydney at Port Botany. The opposition leader, Bill Shorten, along with Al Anthony Albanese and the member for Kingsford Smith, Matt Thistlethwaite, in that marginal Labor seat of Kingsford Smith in Sydney South. So Matt Thistlethwaite holds that with a margin of 2.9%, another one of the seats to watch on election night. Bill Shorten covering a range of issues there and standing by those comments at the press club yesterday about uh, what he saw as the defining moment of the campaign. Now, while Bill Shorten's been speaking, the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, has held...